everyone. Welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Kevin Valk, and our guest today is New York Times best-selling author. Oh, am I? I don't think I'm New York Times best-selling, but <laughs> yeah, you said, said your biography. Well, then they're wrong. I'm I'm selling, not best-selling, but I'm a New York Times selling right. author. There we go. All right, we're gonna go back. We're gonna do another intro. We can edit this out. That's the beautiful thing. We're live on the feed, but yeah, I'm not I'm not New York Times best-selling. I don't know why that's in there. Oh, I misread. No, but I, I like how you're thinking. We're doing the secret right here. OK. Well, here we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Kevin Valk, and our guest today is Amber Benson. <laughs> Who does nothing. <laughs> She's author, writer, actor, director, producer. You've done a ton of stuff. So in her new book is The Witches of Echo Park, and it's out now in stores everywhere. And so we're very, very excited to have you here for this. And Good God, I'm, I'm reading, well, no, because I'm reading through your insanely incredible career, and in the past, you know, we talked about this before, was in your past 15 years or so, you've written about 20 books, yeah. and that's in addition to all of your, you know, film and TV work, which is over, you know, 65 films. He's been on IMDb. A little bit. <laughs> Plus, you know, all the writing, directing, producing, it's insane. Where, how do you find time for all this? Um, I have no real life. That does not exist. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, um, we were talking earlier, like I'm, I'm an artist and I'm constantly trying to pay my bills. So invariably when someone's like, you want to come do this thing? I'm like, will they pay me? <laughs> yes, I want to come do that thing. Um, and I get bored really easily. I have that, that weird like, um, thing where your brain is, is, it needs to be fully occupied 24 seven. And so doing one thing, I get, I get really bored. I need to do like five things at once. I'm a, I'm a multitasker. I think that's a feminine trait. <laughs> Well, uh, you grew up in Alabama, you moved to California, and uh, mm -hmm. you were sort of a tomboy growing up, you said, right? Yeah, yeah. So what was that experience like kind of moving out when you were young out to Hollywood? Because was that basically for acting? Um, no, my dad is from Los Angeles originally. He grew up as, a, a, as one of the only Jews in Southgate, California, <laughs> which is like a little suburb of, of Los Angeles. It was a very Irish Catholic neighborhood. And then he moved to Alabama, because that's a huge Jewish population, which there is actually. <laughs> Um, I went to Temple in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm a nice Jew girl from Alabama, randomly. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we came back out here. Um, and, yeah, I totally wanted to do this. I grew up doing theater in Alabama. It's, you know, the only thing you can do. It's not like you're going to be doing TV or film or anything like that there. Um, and uh, it was a bit of culture shock to come out to, to California from, from the South. The South is very slow. Everything takes a long time. And you come to California and people don't stop. It's just rah, 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 go, 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 go. And you get a little bit of whiplash. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm adjusted now. I can whiplash with the best of them. <laughs> and so, so when, you're, when you're around the age of 14, you did, you did The Crush with Alicia Silverstone. I did. And then you did you know, Steven Soderbergh's King of, the, King of the Hill. And that yeah. was kind of your big breakout hit. So what was the transition to get into acting for you there? Um, well, you know, I'd done theater and stuff growing up, and then we moved to, to California, and my mom was like, well, if you keep your grades up, you can be an actor. Because <laughs> that's what you do when you be an actor. You know, you've got to keep your grades up if you want to be an actor, or go to medical school. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I just started auditioning, and I actually, um, the, first thing I, the first big thing I did was this movie called King of the Hill that Steven Soderbergh directed. It's beautiful very, very little scene film, uh, highly recommended. It. it takes place in the 1930s in St. Louis during the Depression, and uh, stars a young Adrian Brody and uh, Lauren Hill from the Fugees, and uh, just like an amazing cast. Um, and I just, I, I'm a cinephile. I've always been like a film nerd. We would go see, when, growing up in Alabama, we would go see like two or three, in the summers, we would go see like two or three movies in a row, my mom and sister and I. It's like, The Man with the One Red Shoe and Joe versus the Volcano <laughs> and Cujo. <laughs> um, so I just, I fell in love with films. So I, I've always been like a film whore. And uh, so I knew who Steven Soderbergh was when I was 14. I had seen Sex, Lies, and Videotape. Shh, don't tell my mom. <laughs> um, and so I was really excited to go in there and, and meet him. And I just kind of gushed all over him. I was like, I really like Sex, Lies, and Videotape. And he had this look like, why is a 14-year-old watching that movie. <laughs> um, and then we, we ended up talking about trains, because my mom doesn't like to fly. Huh. He didn't like to fly. So we talked about taking trains everywhere, which I still try and do on occasion, take a train cross country yeah, every now and then. You talked about that. You went from San Francisco to New York at one point, right? Yeah, and I set up in coach, which was really stupid. <laughs> and I was, on, I was on the train with a bunch of um, Mennonites, and they were reading, um, they were reading um, uh, oh, I'm blanking the name of it. It's like Amish romances. 
So the covers are like a woman with like the, you know, like the Mennonite hat and she's like this and there's like two dudes like all dressed in black behind her and you're like, oh, that's the triangle, the love triangle. <laughs> and there's no touching or sex. <laughs> yeah, they're called bonnet rippers. That's what they're called. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a real genre of book. Well, that's our next series. There it is. There it is. I'm totally going to do you that. You have everything to draw from. I love you from <laughs> far away. We can't be together and we can never kiss. <laughs> but I want to have your babies. Jeez. <laughs> well, we're... Uh, what, so what were some of your influences growing up, and what were your films? Because obviously you were a kid, but you're watching very adult films. Yeah, yeah. Um, God, I just remember my mom, my poor mother, she's going to be so embarrassed. She got my sister and I, uh, at the video store she rented, The Last Tango in Paris, because she remembered it being like this really lovely foreign film. We put it in, we're watching it, and my mom's like, Oh, oh, like in front of the <laughs> TV trying to block it. Like, she's like, this is not what I remember. Um, so that's the weird family that I grew up with. My dad took my sister. No, my sister wasn't born yet. He took me to see Gandhi, which is three hours. I spent a lot of time in the arcade at the movie mm -hmm. theater because it was a very long movie. Of course. Um, so, so Gandhi is an influence. That was a big influence, obviously, in all your um, work. But, you know, I love comedy. Preston yeah. Sturges is one of my all-time favorites. Right. I don't know if you guys are screwball comedy fans, but, oh, he's a genius. Well, he's dead, but he was a genius. <laughs> <laughs> he did all these amazing films, specifically one called Sullivan's Travels, which mm -hmm. is sort of a film that I feel like kind of crystallizes my sort of journey in the world. Because, you know, we all want to make things that, like, impact the world. And then we forget that, you know, when you're making those big, impactful, like, Oh, brother, where art thou? Oh, massive men kind of lead lives of quiet desperation sort of movies. People need to laugh, too. And, uh, and I try and balance that. I want people to have a good time, but also instill in them a little bit of, of, of depth and seriousness. Yeah. So, yeah. Fall and a good, Banana, and then. You see any good films this year? Um, I really enjoyed Whiplash, but my all time favorite, and everybody I, I've talked to does not like it. I'm the only one, but it, <laughs> I think it was made for me. Um, Batman and Robin. Yes. The cod pieces, they're really just, they're made for me. Um, for when I go through TSA with my harem pants. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go there. <laughs> this is a side conversation. <laughs> this is a side, this is for later, this is the sidebar. Um, no, uh, Inherent Vice. I don't know if you guys saw it. Is this, it just came out, right? Is yeah, it's the Thomas Paul, Anderson, Paul right? Thomas Anderson. Yeah. And it, it was like he made, I'm looking at the cameras now. It was made for me. It's like he knows me. It's, it's like an absurdist uh, long goodbye, which Altman is one of my favorites. Um, and I love mysteries, detective stuff, and I love things centered in LA. And I literally went to the, uh, the arc light and sat at the, the dome, and uh, they're doing things with the cameras. I'm watching them. <laughs> they're very nice. Um, but uh, I, I sat at the, in the dome watching this film, and literally the dude across from me in the aisle was laughing at all the same places I was, which was pretty much the whole movie. And I was like, oh my god, my soulmate. <laughs> is across the aisle from me. When this movie's over, I'm going to go introduce myself. So credits roll. He's still there. I'm still there. Lights come up. I turn, and he's a 17-year-old Hispanic kid <laughs> in a hoodie. <laughs> and I was like, I think he's his donor, and he was just laughing. <laughs> he wasn't the same sense of humor. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was like, that would be inappropriate. I'm 38. That would be really, <laughs> hey, kid. We've got the same sense of humor. <laughs> what other things we got in common? <laughs> oh uh, <laughs> I don't know how to segue. And so, <laughs> and so about this kid. And uh, so, I mean, of course, it's all led to, you know, I don't want to spend too much time going into this because I know we want to talk about the Echo or the uh, Witches of Echo Park, but, uh, you know, you spent, uh, you know, three seasons on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So, yeah. who's the fans Woo! here? Yeah, there's a lot of hands. Because it is like a drug. That show is crack. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people grew up with it, you know, and, and just worldwide. And, you know, Joss Whedon, you know, did an amazing job with the show and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So how was it working with him? Uh, it was an amazing experience. I mean, he really, like, it is his point of view. It is his voice. Uh, everything that is that is on the screen when you're watching, you know, Buffy or Angel or Firefly, one of those shows, that that is all coming from him. Um, and what's so wonderful about it is, well, first of all, the writing is incredible. So when you're you're you know you're getting these scripts and you're going to be shooting these episodes, you're like, oh, I really am excited to say these words because they're smart and funny and interesting. Um, and then on top of that, I think there is a character for everybody. You can watch those shows and you can find somebody that you're like, oh, that's me. 
or that's who I want to be, or that's who I want to be with. <laughs> and there's a lot of very uh, handsome and uh, attractive people on that show. That. Lovely ladies out. and gentlemen. Um, but, um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think he just, he created these characters that people can identify with. You know, and if you don't want the horror and the sci-fi aspect of it, you can connect to the relationships. You can connect to like the fact that you know my character and, and Willow, her girlfriend, we like raised Dawn, the key, the sister of, of Buffy. You know, like yeah. we were we were like a family. That I, I don't know. It was a really lovely experience. Yeah, and Joss, I mean, he's he's great at writing really empowering and, and real female characters. You know, yeah. they're just not the you know heroine in distress and you know or damsel in distress. You know, he's they're very very strong characters, especially your character. I mean, your character was a beloved character. And you know, spoiler alert for anyone. Who, you know, <laughs> I think we're gonna get into spoilers is. there a little bit for people who haven't seen it. It's been out for like. Yeah, it's, I think it's 11 years old. Go see it. Come it's, on. Yeah, I yeah. think it's... Come on. Uh, no, but I mean, your character was beloved on the show, and you know, yeah. you did an amazing, amazing job with oh, that. You're I think so sweet. You're, no, Thank you were. I think everyone thinks that, right? Yeah. Aww. Yeah. All right, I'll everyone's you guys all later. For everyone can't see. <laughs> you know, but what was amazing about the, uh, you know, your character, and you've talked about that a lot about this in interviews, but just, you know, the relationship with Allison's character. Yeah. And really, I mean, this is one of the, f you know, this is back in like the late 90s, early 2000s, where, you know, gay characters really weren't in the mainstream television. You know, you know, LGBT characters really. I mean, Will and Grace had just come out like '98 and kind of started gaining ground and stuff. I like think that. I think Ellen had had or a Ellen kiss, had a show. yeah. And I think that was like the first right like LGBTQ sort of moment. But um, I think what was so great about Buffy is it wasn't gratuitous. It wasn't about exactly. it wasn't about two you know like let's get some hot girls making out you know ooh. Um, it was about two people who fell in love with each other and they both happened to be girls. So what? Who cares? You know. And that that was the beauty of of what Joss did. And it was kind of um, a mash note to some friends of his. He had, a, he had a, um, a friend and her partner who he was very close to. And I think that relationship was sort of him going, you know, I love you guys and I love this relationship and I want to I wanna have the world see it. Hmm. Now, was there any kind of, was it easy working with Alison Hannigan in, in terms of like, were you guys friends off screen? So it yeah. like, seems easier to work it's with. It's so her. weird. Like, I knew her before she was on Buffy. Oh, no way. We'd like hung out and we have a lot of mutual friends. And so huh. when I show up on set, it wasn't like I was just coming into this cold, dark place where nobody <laughs> likes me. I knew Allie. Um, and I was so bummed because I love Seth Green. I had worked with him before. And he's just like truly one of the funniest human beings that walks the earth. And I was like, oh, I'm going to get to work with Seth. And they're like, no, <laughs> you're going to be replacing Seth. <laughs> like, no, no, no. <laughs> First of all, no one can replace Seth. And second of all, wait, I want to work with him. That's not fair. <laughs> I remember going to, a, there was this forum called The Bronze. It was sort of the beginnings of, of these like fan forums where you could go and you could like, you know, talk to the Buffy community. And a lot of times the writers and the actors and the producers would go and, and do little chats and things and just show up randomly at like 3 in the morning to, with their little <laughs> handles. Um, and uh, so they had like a party to raise money for charity, the bronze um, did. And uh, I went to the first one, and I was in the bathroom peeing. And for some reason, the bathroom just is, permeates my life. Just like, <laughs> I always have stories about the toilet. My favorite thing about Google, heated toilet seats. Um, but amongst other things. But um, I'm in the bathroom, and like these two women come in, and they're like, ah. I don't know about this Tara character. <laughs> just really, like, Oz is the best. And I was just like, do I stay in the stall or do I go out? So they're keep, they talk for a while. And I was like, OK, I can't be in here forever. <laughs> this is getting a little ridiculous. So finally, I come out, and they're like, <gasps> Oh, we know we love it, it. <laughs> and I ended up becoming Awkward. friendly with one of them. This this uh, this friend of mine, Wendy Shapiro. We became friends after that. But her handle was like Oz Lady. So I'm like, obviously, <laughs> she's not. She ain't gonna like me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So did you guys go to like? Because you guys went to Comic Con and stuff like that before too, right? Oh yeah. Like what was that like? Is it, it could have been it's crazy. <laughs> well, that was a from little, your perspective. That was a little. That was a little. I mean, I had no idea. I didn't know when I said I was going to be uh, like doing two episodes on the show Buffy the Vampire Slayer that my whole life was going to change. I didn't know that there were things like Comic Con. I didn't know that that world existed. I'm a geek, but I'm more of like like a book movie geek. I wouldn't say that I was like a full on comic book geek. I didn't really. That wasn't the world that I came from. Um, but everybody is so wonderful in this sort of geek nerd world. They just embrace you and bring you in. 
it's so nice to be in an environment that is not um, exclusionary, where they just, th there's like this openness, there's this like, oh, I don't fit, and you don't fit, let's hang out together. Let's like, let's not exclude other people, let's bring people in. And I really like that, because I feel like with so many other sort of cliques in the world, there's this like, oh, you're not like us, well, you can go blank yourself. We don't want you in our group. And I don't feel that with, with like the Buffy world and with yeah. the nerd geek culture. I feel like it's very embracing of, of everybody, and I like that. But I didn't know. I had no idea that that was the world I was about to enter yeah. into. Um, but like, I, like Seth would wear like a Boba Fett mask and like walk around Comic Con. Otherwise, he couldn't get through the floor. Like he he would be stopped. Every he wanted day. to see this stuff just like everyone. Yeah, because he's like a full on like. Yeah. 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 So he Probably. yeah he couldn't yeah, yeah he wouldn't like make it. He would <laughs> he's, he's yeah. He would get he would get attacked. So it was being on that show, you know, playing the character, you know, uh, with witches and vampires and everything. Did that influence a lot of your writing and kind of your interest in that genre? I was always super interested in uh, mythology and religion and the occult. Um, I read The Mists of Avalon when I was like thirteen or fourteen, um, and I know it's not. We can't even talk about uh, Mary Zimmer Bradley anymore because of all the crazy stuff that came out about her. But um, that book was very seminal in my life, and. Um, you know, I was just I was so curious about things other than the like the Judaism I grew up with, and then my mom's parents are like Southern Baptist, born again, crazy, intense, <laughs> you know, laying out of hands kind of stuff. Um, it was really funny growing up. I was in a carpool for elementary school, and it was like all the Jewish kids. And one of the moms was like, "I always know when Amber's grandparents are in town because she comes in the car talking about the blood of the lamb." <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, how can you not be like bizarre and weird like I am, having grown up with that? It's like blood of the lamb on one side, and then a psychiatrist um, <laughs> Jew from Southgate, California, on the other. Like, there's no winning. You're just gonna be weird. But that, but that life is great for influencing your work and putting that. Oh yeah, I mean, it's all. It's so funny. I was at my therapist, and I was. I go to therapy. I love therapy. I suggest everyone try therapy. You've heard it here. You've heard it here. It's the new thing. Therapy. <laughs> it helps. Um, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, but I was talking about, I'm looking at the book, but I was, I was talking about the book with my therapist and she's like, so like, this is super personal because this is like your family and your life. And I was like, no, it's not. Oh my God, it is. <laughs> oh, I even use like the predeterminist Baptist, you know, like Southern Baptist, like it all is in there. Like all the crazy stuff is in there. And I didn't even realize it. That's what's so crazy about being an artist is like you make this stuff because you feel compelled to make it, but you don't know where it's coming from until it's like done and other people are looking at it and judging it. And you're like, oh no, no, don't judge that. I didn't mean for that to get out. <laughs> I'm frightened now. <laughs> um, it, now, is that different though, I guess, with, you know, with a, a film or a show? You, you do it and you pour it It's collaborative, it's, so yeah. it's not just your insanity. It's like group insanity. It gets balanced a little bit. I'm sure it's kind of like when you guys here at Google work together on something. It's not just one person's vision. It becomes like the vision of 20, 30 people. And that's what it's like working on a show like Buffy. You know, that's what's so wonderful about it is it's not, even though I say it, you know, it's Joss's vision and like he gives over to, to the actors and the writers and the production people and the crew and everybody has a stake in it. And you feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. Yeah. You know, and that's really, that's a drug to feel like you, you're part of something and that you're making an impact on the world because of that. Oh, for sure. And, you know, when you're on Buffy, you, so that this kind of started your transition into writing, it seemed like, is did you start writing on Buffy? Because you did comic books for them, right? Yeah, I, I co, with Christopher Golden, he and right. I did some like Willow Terra comics for Dark Horse, and that was super fun. And um, we had um, Terry Moore, who does Strangers in Paradise. I don't know if you're fans, but yeah. See some nodding over there. Who's genius? He did. Uh, he did the first um, run of those, and they're just the women look. I mean, they look like real women. They have breasts and hips, and they're not disproportionate. And if they weren't real, they wouldn't. You know, like I love that. If Barbie was real, she'd like fall over from the waist. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah. I, but I'd always written. Yeah. I wrote a lot of really uh -huh. bad poetry growing up, like really <laughs> like every writer is the flowers <laughs> dead kind of like just <laughs> dark and like nihilistic, and like absurdist plays and short stories, hmm. and uh, yeah, when I was working on Buffy, I was like, I I love being on this show, but my brain got sucked out and I'm kind of bored. Um, <laughs> I just get to <laughs> run around on my PJs all day, so. Um, 
maybe I should be doing some more fun things with my writing. So I, you know, you sit, you sit, when you're on a film set, you sit in your trailer most of the time. It's a lot of like, hurry up, wait. Um, and so I started just writing more and more stuff, and that, yeah, that was sort of the beginning of that whole world opening up to me. I mean, Buffy has opened so many doors. Without it, I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you guys. Bless you. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm really, really lucky, and uh, you know, it's the springboard via which my my life came really crazy and interesting and fun. Yeah, I mean, right after Buffy, you started, you know, directing and producing and starring. You mm -hmm. did Chance. Mm -hmm. Lovers, Liars, and Lunatics, and then you co-directed with one of your uh, cast members, Adam Bush, uh, yes. Drones. Yes, which is a great film. Oh, and so, what was the out of it? Yeah, no, and th that's so. What, what was I think that? you guys can relate. It's uh, it's about people that might or might not be aliens in an office. A lot of cubicles. Yeah, you got some. I spent a lot of time arranging cubicles in <laughs> Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where we shot it. <laughs> like, got there because we, you know, you get there early for prep and. They had, they're like, you can use these cubicles. And they were just sort of like this, like, it was like the a maze. It was like a labyrinth. I thought someone was going to, you know, like the Minotaur was going to come out and eat me at one point. It was just, and like, how can you, like, function in here? So we ended up, like, physically, like, me and this dude, like, moving them around. It's like, ah, I feel so <laughs> Moving the cubicles. <laughs> So what was so was that kind of the slow transition to writing where you were like, oh, I want to write, direct, produce, and everything. I want to do it all. And then you just started kind of peeling back a little bit by well, little bit. Well, I, I realized that if you want to like be the, you know, the conductor of your own train, to go back to the train analogy, um, you have to, you know, you have to create your own content. Yeah. And that, that's what I wanted to do. I didn't, I wanted to be the, 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 you know, the mover of my own destiny. I wanted to be in control. As an actor, you're really, you know, at the mercy of other people. You're like a pawn in someone else's chess game. And I was like, I want to be the chess master. <laughs> I don't want to be the pawn. I want to be the computer. That's even better. Maybe I'll just be Alan Turing. <laughs> Except not die. So there, um, did you find any similarities between writing a movie and writing a novel? Um, writing a novel is really freaking hard because yeah. it's, it's, you know, 100,000 words oftentimes. This book is a little less than that. But um, whereas a screenplay, you just sit down and, you know, it's 60 pages or 120 pages. Um, the book is really intense. Are you leaving? Really, you're leaving? No, no I'm just teasing. Go, go. <laughs> well, He's got to grab lunch. <laughs> totally mean. He's like, I hate her. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I feel like for me, you know, you do a lot of revisions on both, but like, it, it's like the long haul. It's, it's like marathon running when you're writing a book. Interesting. So with uh, your process for writing, I guess, novels, what is that for you? So do you just start typing and just start writing down ideas, or do you kind of outline kind of where you want the story to go, or do you have a character in mind? Or um, Well, they, in, in, in writing, in the writing world, they like to say, are you a, are you a plotter or a pantser? <laughs> and uh, I, I have done both. I have plotted and I have pantsed. Um. <laughs> it's got dirty. I know. It, 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 it's not even, dirty. I know, it's the harem pants. That's what she they said, just, comments all over the it's place. The, it's the low crotch. Um, I was telling them earlier, I was, I was walking by a Walmart, and this woman walked up. She's like, your pants are falling. Oh, <laughs> they're just low. They're, I'm, I'm, you know, keeping things in there yeah. for later. I am got my lunch in there. <laughs> <laughs> that is so disgusting. Okay. Yeah, a little bit. I can't and you don't even have like to you. scratch that. I don't even care. Uh, <laughs> but, um. But uh, so, yeah, so sometimes it's fun to just sit down and just like see where the book goes. That means you're, you're a pantser. You go by the seat of your pants. Or, you know, in, in you know, the converse of that, you're a, you're a, a, you know, a plotter. And uh, because I started out co-writing with Christopher Golden, we wrote a couple of books in this Ghost of Albion series for, um, mm -hmm. for Del Rey Random House. Um, when you're writing with somebody else, you have to plot it. You have to sit down and have a very intense outline. Otherwise, it's like, the characters are doing, wait, why are the characters going to Morocco? <laughs> That was not what we talked about. Well, I just felt like they want to go to Morocco. Um, so, yeah, so you have to outline when you're writing with somebody else. I think you have to write, you know, when you're writing, or outline when you're writing with somebody else. But um, with these books, I like to outline. Yeah. Does that answer your question in a very roundabout? No, 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 it does. Backdoor sort of way? No, it opens up more questions because I was, I, <laughs> well, because I'm curious about that process of writing with a co-writer. So, because you were talking about with the, with the ghost series and everything, was that, was it hard to kind of keep the same voice throughout or did you guys kind of have more of a shorthand and just kind of, well, where you were going. I was really lucky. I had never, you know, I'd written short stories, but I'd never written like full on prose, a book, you know, that, that whole thing. And Chris is a, you know, 
really, really talented novelist, and he writes comics yeah. and screenplay. He does everything. And uh, so I like to say that I went to Chris Golden University and learned how to be a <laughs> prose writer. So, you know, we would go chapter by, you know, or two chapters at a time. You had the outline, and then you'd break it down by the two chapters. And I would turn it in, and he'd be like, OK, now go back in. You don't need to describe the chair for 50 pages. Like, just go back in and, like, clean that, you know. So I, I feel like he was really sort of um, instructive on how to be a, a good prose writer and to be sparing with your words, but also to, like, you know, write nice stuff that makes sense. And yeah. so we would go back and forth and, you know, he would smooth it out and make sure that the voices sounded the same. Nice. And so then you had Calopy Reaper Jones, that whole series, you did a yes. five book in that. Yes. And so, but that was completely on your own. Yeah, that was the first time I'd written something by myself as far as like book stuff. And I was really frightened because there would be no one to blame if it was <laughs> bad. Um, <laughs> couldn't call Chris and be like, hey, Chris. <laughs> Um, yeah, so yeah, so I pitched those those uh, books to to my editor, and we ended up doing five of them. It was supposed to be a trilogy, and then when five. I was about to turn in the third book, she was like, "Oh, we want to do two more." I was like, "Oh crap!" So I had to go back in and untie some little ties that had been uh, <laughs> to finish out. Yeah, so I could That's continue. Good name, it was two great. Books, it was yeah. it was awesome. It was really fun, and those books are really fun and light and fluffy and silly and. And the, my crutch is humor, as you can tell from this. Like, I love to go to the silly, dirty place, you know? Because we'll I get just, into that. Yeah, I just, you know, for like. People who haven't read the book. <laughs> Some naughty, no. magic sex in there. Naughty antler sex. <laughs> naughty antler sex. <laughs> the weirdest thing I've ever read. I'll be honest. <laughs> the weirdest thing. I'm like, what is going on? You're going to sell so many books <laughs> just with that comment. You got to see there. it. And he's Naughty red. Magic Look at, sex. He's like right, right. I am, because it's so awkward. <laughs> he's it was like awkward reading it. It's that, it's that moment where you're like reading a book. You're like, is anyone looking at me? <laughs> Try writing it in a freaking like coffee shop and being like. <laughs> or doing a live book read. Do you ever do live book reads and sex scenes? <laughs> um, actually, uh, <laughs> So do you guys know who Patrick Rothfuss is? Yes. Yeah. So Pat is a friend of mine, and we did a, a reading together at Skylight Books in LA a couple of years ago. And we were sort of bitching before the reading about having to write sex scenes. And I was like, why don't we read dueling sex scenes for the, uh, for the signing? He's like, that's a great idea, because he was complaining about his, and I was going So he gets up, and he reads his, and it's plucking the leer of her love. You know, like the wind blew through the trees. I'm like, that's not a sex scene like what I have. Um, mine is finger banging in a subway. <laughs> so he gets up there, he reads his, and I'm just like, I cannot believe. So I was like, Pat, you have to read with me. So he, like the gentleman and lovely human being that he is, he, um, don't, he raises so much money with his uh, charity, World Builders. I don't know if you guys know, but like, please go check it out. Awesome stuff. But um, he read the, the dude part in my little excerpt of the sex scene. So he had to be, oh, Calliope. Like, like the guy had a southern accent. And Pat like, you know, looks like he stepped out of, you know, Middle Earth. Like, you know. And yeah. finger banging in the subway. <laughs> Buy the book. Oh my god. So yes, I have read naughty bits in public. Oh, OK. Well, and I had to read the audio book of this. Oh, you did you do the audiobook for this? I did. I read the oh, audiobook oh. for this. And um, yeah. Every time the word clit was mentioned, I had to stop. <laughs> because the engineer and I were both laughing. I'm like, don't look at me. <laughs> don't the word no don't look at me. We all know what that is. It's mm. not it's like a real world word. <laughs> well it's hot and awkward in here now. So we're gonna go into uh, <laughs> it's uh, we're going to go into the Witches of Echo Park, <laughs> that it's all about antler sex. We're going to go into the Go Witches into of Echo Park. naughty magic antler sex. And no, but it tells the story of uh, a young woman, Lise, who lived in Georgia. And uh, she gets a phone call from her aunt who's dying over in Echo Park, in, or just outside of LA. Dying over in Echo Park. Yeah, over in Echo just, just right yonder. No, she goes to LA. And what, what, you know, what was interesting to me was you know, reading your biography, you go from Alabama to LA. So it was yeah. a lot of that influenced by your childhood at all? Yeah, I didn't realize, like I said before, apparently it's my, yeah, there's a lot of me in there. Not in the antler sex part. <laughs> We don't know this. <laughs> <laughs> that that was an homage to the Mist of Avalon, which is the horned god and the whole like, and it's uh, it's not even a real sex scene. Like it is an imagined drug induced ritual sex scene. So it doesn't even happen in real life. It's like a fantasy in the book. So it's a pretend sex scene, but it's about you know the, you know the, the the goddess mating with the horned god in order to whatever. Everyone's Stop like now. frantically scared. Because I'm just the digging book. myself in a hole here with my horns and my. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
starts on page 62 for you guys. <laughs> what? Just kidding. I have no idea what page is on. This guy immediately <laughs> opens up, what page is this? Kevin's going to read it for us right now. Follow along in your books. <laughs> Zero starting with <laughs> I'm going to play the role of the antlers. So, <laughs> Jesus. I don't know if we can film this. So, so uh, what, what drew you to Echo Park? Did you live in that park? It's a real part of LA. It is. I'm, uh, it's, it's, I, it's my, my hood. I'm, I'm an east sider. Um, I love the east side of Los Angeles. I love Echo Park and Los Feliz and Silver Lake and downtown and Atwater and like just uh, the east side is where it's at, I think. Um, people will argue with me, but mm -hmm. I just, I don't think I could live in LA except I live in that neighborhood. Um, it's super magical. You walk around, and in between all the hipster coffee shops um, are botanicas. You walk in, and you can buy spells and saints' candles. And this is my joke that I've told a zillion times: Aquanet hairspray, because who doesn't need Aquanet while you're doing spells? <laughs> um, and uh, it's just it's magical. You 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 have these stair streets, like stairway stairways that actually have like a street name because you cannot access the houses on these hills except via the stairs so you walk up the stairs and they're giant and they just go on and on and up it's it's just like it, you i don't know it's just bizarre and they're like little bungalows with fairy lights and i it just oh, it's so magical that if you walk up to the top of echo park avenue there's like this um this like empty field and there's a giant tree and this swing just sitting there, and you can sit in the swing. And it used to say, this is where memories come. Or no, this is where memories go, not come. <laughs> um, this is where memories go. <laughs> and uh, you sit in the swing, and you look out all over like, like Atwater and Glendale. And it's just, I mean, it's so magical. And there's nobody up there. And it's like just on the, the underside of Elysian Park. I mean, it's just, oh, you just, it's like stepping into another world. I took my friend um, uh, Dave Nadelberg. I love how I'm name checking everybody, so they'll all be. Um, I took him on like this magic hike. I took him all the way up Echo Park Avenue. We went to the swing. We like walked down through this little culvert, and then we found this this beautiful house that has like um, a mermaid figurehead from a ship on it. And uh, we <laughs> sit and kind of hung out there. And there are these streets that go nowhere, <laughs> little dead end, little boarded up house. And I don't know. It's just it's like a whole other world. And to me, that's Echo Park, and that's why I wanted to write about it because I feel like. Everyone needs to know how awesome it is. Well, it's crazy because in the book, when I was reading it, it was I didn't think it was actually a real place. And then when I actually looked up Echo yeah. Park, because I had brought it up to one of my coworkers as I was reading it, and she was like, I think it's a real place. Because yeah. she lived outside of LA, and I had no idea. So that's really cool. The, the greatest compliment I got um, was, uh, so, so my ex Adam's dad, Rob Bush, who's awesome. Uh, Rob, um, uh, Rob is a proofreader for me for my books, and I had to preface the reading of this with, don't look at the naughty parts. <laughs> so my ex's dad reads my naughty antler sex scenes, which is so embarrassing. But he's lovely. He's the sweetest guy, and he's just like so smart and catches every freaking typo. Um, he, he wrote me this email. He's like, I had to stop while I was reading the book to, to Google things to see what you had made up and what was real. And I was like, and I was telling Kevin, like, I spend a lot of time on Google Maps with Street View because there are places that, like, I've been once or I haven't been, and I want to get a feeling for it. So I actually go in and, like, do the 360 and then try and get in people's houses, but you guys won't let me. Um, <laughs> Working on it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, like, you can actually, like, go on, a, like, you can see, like, that the, some of the places are real. Like, the house on Current Street is actually based on a real house that, that I, I love that's on the street that I, you know, I will never say the actual address, but <laughs> there's a real house in Echo Park that I sort of based it on. And oh, it's like a koi pond and a bridge that goes over it. and Just super magic. I don't know. I just, uh, I love it. I need magic in my life. Yeah. Well, life you, is very short. And it well, you have it. I mean, you get magical. to escape to it every time when you're reading your, I do. your books, you know? Um, you know, and you, the interesting thing about this story is that it's, it's, it's almost like one big setup for like, it's, is it going to be a trilogy? Yeah, yeah, we're okay. going to do more. So this was like the beginnings. This was sort of the, because I didn't want to give away too much. Cause I, got, <laughs> I got so many more books to write now. I got to like get on a <laughs> stick and make it happen. Is it get on the stick or get on a stick? I keep fighting with people over that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Get no. on the stick. I got to get on stick. the stick. Not a stick. Not a stick. Just a random stick, stick somewhere. Just a random stick. It's going to be. <laughs> Hot and awkward, and so, <laughs> so are you looking at three stories? Is that kind of what you're? Yeah, it's like it's the, the sort of the over 
So I'm a like once it's again. A, well, why don't we tell the story? Tell the story oh. of kind of what it's about too. So it's sort of it's about this girl who's uh, who she doesn't the woman who raised her, she doesn't know that that she's a witch and she goes off to live her life and she gets this call from the woman who raised her, her great aunt, who says I'm dying, please come home. So she comes home and that's when she discovers that her that her great aunt is the master of this this coven in Echo Park and and so she is asked to kind of step in and to take over her great aunt's uh, position in the coven when her great aunt dies. Um, and so that's sort of the beginnings of the story. But really, I'm kind of obsessed with, um, you know, there are all these sort of um, fanatical sort of sects of different religions where they're like, we want World War III because we want to you know, bring about the end of times. We want to like wipe the slate clean and have, have everything start over again. And I was like, well, that's a fascinating thing. I want to write about that, but I don't want to make it specifically about a religious kind of thing. So I created this, this thing called the flood, and that is what is coming. They want to bring about the end of times. And they're sort of a corporate sort of um, anti-magic witchcraft sort of, and they want to get rid of all of the witches. And that's sort of what's going to happen over the course of this series is that they're stepping in, they're trying to eradicate everything and start over. I was just like, I want to talk about that stuff. That's so interesting, that, that mindset. They think they're doing this great thing, and maybe it's not so great. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, well you reference it you know, pretty early on, and it's really cool just hearing about it. And in my mind, I thought I was going to see it by the end or whatever. And all of a sudden, I kept building up, building up. And mm -hmm. the ends, I'm like, ooh, ooh, there's more. Got to get alleviate yeah. with a little something, something. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I wish I could. I wish I could have just taken the first and the second book and made them one. Just but. argument. Well, I mean, the book really does something really different. What you guys are going to love about it, I was telling her, is that you know I don't read a ton, but I love movies and I love audiobooks and stuff. And but what really, really, this book really, really kept my attention. And I'm not even really demographic for it either. But like, no, no, well, antler sex you know. is not. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Other than that, it. but uh, you know, but what really kept my attention was that it's actually told from six different characters. Perceptions, yeah, right? or perspectives, I should say, and so it's really interesting because I mean, Eleonora and Lise uh, really get the majority of the book, but mm -hmm. it kind of bounces back and forth. So that's what kept my attention is that usually I kind of zone off, and I'm like, oh, what the hell happened? And I have to go all the way back. Yeah, I made him work. Like, now you, you to... did. I mean, because it's like, oh my god, now I got to go back to you know uh, Devandra, and you know, and it's it's really interesting, kind of bouncing back and forth from chapter to chapter, and kind of getting these different perspectives. Whereas normally, you know, in books as we know, they kind of you know it's from Harry Potter's perspective or this person's perspective or whatever, you know. Yeah, I just I got really like burnt out on my other series because it's first person narrative point of view, and you're just like in that character's head, and you don't know anything that they don't know, and it just I was just like I can't do this anymore. I need like some third person release. <laughs> God, I need like some separation. I need third person. I need like to be outside of my character's heads a little bit, and that's where <laughs> stop looking at me like that. <laughs> that's where um, I told you I have the mind of a twelve year old. <laughs> Come on, like that's Beavis and Butthead is yeah. like, um, but uh, but yeah, I just I yeah I wanted it to be from different points of view, multi narrative, and uh, and to, to to make it so it wasn't muddy. You know, every chapter has you know who it is, who the point of view is going to be from. So I, I think it's pretty easy to follow. You don't get too lost. Oh no no no, you don't get lost at all. I just think it's really cool that it bounces back and forth. And know, one of the characters is mute, so that's yeah. fun. How do you yeah. do that? Yeah. I kept wanting to go, and she said. Oh, <laughs> She's mute. She can't talk. So what was that process? Um, the mute. Stuff? Yeah, for like what? What? Going back and make sure I didn't like say she said or she <laughs> made a noise or she coughed loudly or laughed. <laughs> um. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. And you know you have some classic witch names in here too. So it's Eleonora, Devandra, Lisbeth. So is any of that inspired by Wizard of Oz or, or Crucible a little bit? Oh, no, yeah, it's interesting. No, I, just, I don't know where the names came. I always collect names. When I come across a cool <laughs> name, I like to file it away. Um, the name that, I, that, that was like the craziest, and I don't know where the hell it came from, it's Hesica. I was like, that's a great name. I love <laughs> that name. Where did that come from? <laughs> and uh, what's really cool is that um, all of the characters are kind of pieces of my, my girlfriends. I have like, I have, a, I have some lady friends in my life. In my 30s, I finally got the like crew of chicks. I got like my, my babysitter's club. <laughs> to re-reference something from way, way, way back. Um, I always wanted that. I always had dude friends. And then I was like, where am I? I want like girlfriends. And I really didn't, ha you know, I'd have like one or two, but I didn't have like a crew. And so it's sort of a mash note to them a little bit. Like none of them, it's not like one of them is that person, but I stole pieces of them <laughs> and put them into, into the book. 
Um, and I was like, it's not, ever, it's not you. It's not, that's not you. Because I was like, they're going to hate me. They're going to be like, you did what with what? <laughs> um, but uh, but it, I, think, I think they're all pleasantly happy yeah. with it. Yeah, no, they're great characters. You know, it seems like these Zonders, you know, they come and go. And, you know, it was, we just kind of got over the whole wolves and vampires thing <laughs> with Twilight. And, wolves and vampires. You know, mm. yeah, well, and, you know, when, uh, you know, Buffy was even more or less ahead of its time, and True Blood kind of has come and gone. Now we're in the zombies with World War yeah. Z and Warm Bodies and Walking Eyes Dead, obviously and... being huge. But now you're, you know, you're good. You're almost a little bit ahead of it with witches because I think that that's kind of something that may be coming back a little bit too. Well, it was, it was interesting when we were coming up with the title for the book because it was like, really, you're gonna call, we're gonna call it the Witches of Echo Park, which was what the title I liked because I thought it was an homage to the Witches of Eastwick. Um, and then the, I, you know, when we finally settled on it, then there was like the witches of Edgeware, and I was like, really, it's the witches of ebook. <laughs> um, but I, it just was, I don't know, it just felt right. Yeah. You know, um, so there is some witch stuff out there, but um, I would love to, to see more of of that stuff. I, I, I really enjoyed playing with with the Wiccan stuff, and yeah. I didn't I didn't take anything. It's not specifically based on anything. You know, I took pieces of lots of different things and created my own things. I didn't want to step on anyone's toes. You know, it's like if I was like, I'm going to write about Jesus in Echo Park. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to offend some people. So, <laughs> yeah, so what were your influences in writing in terms of just not even just the Witcher story, but just your writing style other than Chris Golden? <laughs> um, I'm, I love books. I, you know, I love Russian tragedy. I love Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. <laughs> um, and then on the flip of that, I like, um, you know, like Neil Gaiman and uh, Alice Hoffman and um, God. I just, I just read a bunch of Murakami, which is very interesting and very, very in interesting and <laughs> awesome. Um, and uh, gosh, I mean, I love. Um, Camus and I love every. I, I'll read anything. It, yeah. I was reading in the bathroom here on the wall. I was taking some <laughs> lessons because there are there are lessons in the bathroom. Yeah, playing on the potty and yep, yep, learning on the loo. Yep, learning on the loo. Yeah, That's what I. I was really into that. I was in there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, reading. Um, I mean, anything. I love. I just love books. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, do you struggle with anything when you write? Do you like what? What do you do to get over your writer's block? Um. Huh. It's funny. I, I taught for a while. Actually, one of my one of my students is here in the audience too, um, oh, wow. which is really cool. Um, but Did you I, teach a novel writing classes. And yeah, I was classes, I was right? teaching some some novel writing classes, and I have taught some acting stuff in the past. Um, but that's a question I get a lot. Like, what do I do when I hit the wall? How do I keep moving forward? And I always say, just do something totally insane. Like, take the character and like make them go to you know, I don't know. The Grand Canyon or Disneyland or make them, uh, I don't know, go on a date with Batman or something yeah. crazy. Just do something with your characters that's totally outside the box. You won't use it for what you're working on, but you'll get into the character's headspace again. You'll sort of find yourself reconnecting. Um, by, by, you know, by that also, it's you know, do something totally crazy within the structure of the narrative. Like you can like, OK, I'm going to give this character like uh, there could be a car accident, and you know you might end up using it. Who knows? Um, so <laughs> that's what I try and do: just do something totally crazy, or you can do something physically with your own person, like jump out a you know airplane or something, and that that messes <laughs> and with your head. And experiences. yeah, draw some experience from that. Just you know, shake up your life a little bit. Go on an adventure. Go on an adventure. Go take a hike in Magical Echo Park. <laughs> do the swing where memories are made. Go come. <laughs> well, we're gonna get to a Q and A in a minute if you guys wanna. Uh, raise your hands, but is there a genre in particular that you haven't done yet that you kind of want to get into? Are you kind of comfortable in liking this whole? I like story? cozy mysteries. Mm -hmm. I do. I like I like the Agatha Christie an awful lot. If I yeah, if I had balls, I would try and write like a real deal mystery. <laughs> I'm 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 working up to that. That's something I'd like to do. Yeah. yeah after this whole so you have plan maybe three books in this series. Mm -hmm. And so uh, is the second one, are you starting to write that? or is Yeah, the second one done? is due very shortly. And oh, wow. I, I, got, I got my work cut out for me. Lots to do. Nice. Nice. All right, we're going to go Q&A. Um, I, I don't know if this was ever textual in the show, but uh, uh, Tara and Buffy seemed like she was somebody that had like struggled with speech issues and maybe gone to speech therapy. And you mentioned that there was a, a mute character in this book. Is that something you have a personal connection with, or is it just coincidence that I'm reading too much into? Um, it may be coincidence that you're reading too much into, but maybe not actually, because there is something about that, something that I'm kind of obsessed with as a human being, and I see it in my work too, is this feeling of not being understood. 
you know, you, you speak and you, you say these words and you feel like you're connecting and then someone looks at you and you're like, they have no idea what I'm talking about. We're not connected. I'm not making myself understood. That feeling of impotence, I think, was very important in uh, the Tara story storylines. And it's also something that was important with this character in the book and it's something that I personally like. It is, it just, it rips me apart from the inside when I feel like I'm not understood. I just, I want to like, just uh, curl in a ball. <laughs> so I think, you know, you're, you're, you're not crazy with that question. <laughs> Great question. Yeah, so right behind you. Hi, thanks for coming. Oh, um, thanks for having me. <laughs> Uh, that was really an interesting answer, given that I just looked up on Wikipedia today that you, um, your first show on Buffy was Hush. Yeah, the That's sun. Oh my gosh. Yeah. This, oh, we're having synchronicity. <laughs> <laughs> it is happening right Which happens right to be here. one of my favorite Buffy episodes. Oh, and I watch it every too. Halloween because it's super creepy. But Have lunch with those guys in their full makeup, the gentlemen. <laughs> oh my God. They came and sat down at lunch and I was like, please don't eat me. <laughs> they were so scary. It's a super creepy episode. I yeah, 100% agree. Um, but that was not my question. <laughs> my question was, um, I, as you were talking about the audiobook and reading the audiobook, somehow I remembered that um, John Scalzi was here and he was talking about how Love the Scalzi. you and also Will Wheaton read the audiobook for his book Lock In. Yes. So how did that go? And like, what, what do you, what were your thoughts around that whole situation of like having both perspectives? Um, it's such an interesting book. I know, um, I know Scalzi from like writery stuff and I just think he is, he's awesome. He's the bee's knees. Just he and his whole family, I adore them. They're just like the best people. Um, and, um, he sent, he was like, he sent me this email, or I guess it was a direct message, actually. He's like, hey, we're going to do this, this audio book. Would you be interested in doing it? I think I'm going to have you and Will both do it. Is that something you'd want? I'm like, yes, please, God, anything, yes. <laughs> Love your stuff. I mean, my dad and I, like, geeked out over Old Man's War together, so we have lots of love. Um, and so they sent me the book, and I, I actually, you know, figured out what was, what was going on with it. Um, and I just thought it was so amazing. I, you know, it's a sci-fi book, but it says so much. It's it's talking, and I and I think we can we can look at the the stuff that's going on with like the transgender stuff, where people are feeling like you know I'm not being I'm not being allowed to be who I am. This fluidity of gender, this fluidity of like what my outside is versus what my inside is. All of that is in lock in, and I think it's so progressive and it's saying something that is so important. I don't think people even realize that this this is happening with this book. Because it's about you know what happens when your body is locked and you cannot go out into the world as yourself. You have this uh, this autonomous thing, this machine that is outside of you, and your personality is in it. Then who are you? Are you a boy? Are you a girl? What are you? Are you free of gender? Like what are you? And I find that so fascinating. And I think he is. He, he, people are going to look back at that book and go, "He was at the forefront. He was talking about something really important." Because we're in 2015. Like we're sh we should be able to be whatever we want. Do you know what I mean? We are we are human beings, but that doesn't mean we have to be restricted by our bodies. I don't know. I just I, it was such a wonderful experience. And I love Will. He's wonderful. And and it just I was really lucky that I got to to do that. Thanks. I just got on a soapbox, sorry. No, I, <laughs> I, just, I think it's important. I haven't actually read the book. Read it. Book. Okay. <laughs> Listen to it. <laughs> Anyone else? <gasps> Chew, my student. Going along with your, uh, your audio books that you're doing, um, I've never been one to, I like to read the book, you know, tactile, like the, but I know that you've been doing more and more of the audiobooks, and you have a few other ones out. Are you going to be doing more? How do you decide which ones? I mean, is it one, books that you read and you say, "Oh, I want to read this audiobook," or do they come to you and say, "Would you?" How do you, how do you choose which ones you're going to do, and are you doing any any more? Um, I've done. I've been doing a lot this year, um, and it's them. They come to me. Um, it actually started because. Um, uh, an author that I work with um, had asked me if I would be interested in doing their book, and I was like, "Yeah." So I did. Um, I did um, Caitlin um, Kiernan's books, um, "Blood Orange," I think is the first one, 
and were delicious. Um, but uh, so yeah, so I did those, and then um, I harassed the dude at Audible. I was like, I want to do more of these. These are really fun. <laughs> And so I just email him every now and then and just remind him that I'm alive. And he calls me. And I go in and, you know, I've read some, like, southern fried mysteries. And um, I've read, like, a, like a, um, an LGBTQ coming-of-age story. Um, it's been really wonderful. I've had a really, really wonderful time with these audiobooks. Okay. So. Part B, when mine comes out, will you read mine? Always. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, let's thank uh, Amber Benson for coming today. Uh, and thanks. so, The Witches of Echo Park, which is the first book in a series, yes. uh, is out now, so please go buy it, read it, listen to it, and uh, we look forward to seeing the sequel. Oh, and thank you so much, Kevin. You were awesome. Awesome, great. <laughs> thank news. you, guys. Right. Thanks, guys. <laughs>